Kearney, but there were no women on the courts committee. I was appointed to the courts committee. And suddenly there I was with a many challenges, but one of those challenges was I was pro-choice. I didn't really know what that meant, and now I had the obligation in dealing with the laws of our nation as interpreted under the Constitution by the U.S. Supreme Court and the laws of this Commonwealth to try to understand what choice really was. I give you three markers on that journey. Let me start with the marker that was difficult in one way. And that was in reading the basic U.S. Supreme Court decisions that dealt with abortion the most painful one that I read had to do with partial birth abortion. It was pages and pages. I was impressed that the court very deeply looked into each individual possibility of what might be faced when you're dealing with the health of the mother underscoring that virtually all, abor all, all abortions that may occur in the second and certainly in the third trimester are abortions that are necessitated in the case of women who desperately want to carry out the pregnancy. But the health issues are such that in the medical decision of the woman, hopefully at her side, the father, and the medical doctor are painful, often delayed because you don't want to terminate the pregnancy. And I was impressed at what level of detail the court went in when they made the decision, and here I stand unprepared, I can't cite the name of the decision, but that when they made the decision that they would not outlaw third trimester abortions, that individual cases had to be protected under our Constitution that protects all individuals. Now let me translate that into my own family and watching the incredible months, years of, of hope that this time my daughter-in-law's pregnancy would be a healthy pregnancy and she could go forward. But again and again, usually in the first trimester, it was not to be. There was a particularly hopeful time, though, when as you were approaching the 13th and 14th week, it looked like it wouldn't, wouldn't self-abort. But what became clearer and clearer as you had more detail of the developing fetus, that the fetus did not appear to be healthy. The body hadn't rejected it yet, but the fetus didn't appear to be healthy. So you wait another week, and you wait another week, because you hope that it will be healthy, and you will finally be able to carry out that pregnancy. So by the time that you reach the point when it is absolutely clear that what you are dealing with is the brain being totally sucked into the spinal column, the grief the morning begins as you make that decision. That is one example of what the Supreme Court ruled 
in not making the determination that there is a specific point that we will override the health of the mother, the medical decision of what must go forward. Let me close by giving another example of choice. My own daughter, my own daughter who absolutely is pro-choice. In both of her pregnancies, she actually refused to have, I believe I'm going to say it right, amyocentesis, because she did not want to inadvertently make a decision based on a false positive. That was her choice. Do not assume that women and their families and their medical doctors are making anything but the deepest possible personal moral choice when they exercise choice. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.